anytime you're playing music for the crowd instead of yourself, you're fucked. It's not a matter of referencing the past, although you can, and there's certainly things you can draw from it. It's not a matter of trying to be the future, because you don't know what the future is. You know, their point is, we do it now. We do it our way, and we continually do it now, day after day after day, which is why they survive. You know, I'm grateful this whole thing didn't peter out 15 years ago. That, you know, people still give a shit about us and that we can go virtually wherever we want, you know, when we want to, and people are happy to have us. I mean, I feel incredibly lucky to be able to do that. You know, I mean, we're pretty much outside of any kind of cultural existence. We exist in the past in a lot of people's minds, you know? Um, so there's a certain amount of nostalgia and stuff to it, but I mean, that's, that's, you just can't get away from that, really. If it's valuable to other people, if they like it, that's great, you know, but I think we would do it regardless. <laughs> we, we would still play in the basement sometimes, I think, you know, no matter what, <laughs> so. Uh, can I get a, a, a beer? People oftentimes believe that if they have heard of a band, that the people in that band are well-to-do. And they have a super glamorous lifestyle, and life is easy, and, and it's not always that, especially with independent bands. So the funny thing is when we send out our packages, it's actually listed as Mark Arm um, as the person having sent the package to anybody. So, this is to record stores who receive our records. These are to mail order customers who get our stuff. Like, Mark Arm sends all of our shit to everybody in the world, basically. It's unbelievable that a legend have to work, a normal world to live, and they can live only doing the rock and roll. Some people think that making rock and roll as a second work, as a hobby, helps to stay pure to the spirit. That's a working man's aesthetic. I'm going to certainly make sure that whatever I'm sending out is going to go to the right address on time to the person that it's addressed to. You know, in a way, that's what a great rock band does. You know, they go in, they write their songs, and they go out and play them, and they address them to the people they want to reach. And they do it directly, and they do it with no bullshit. Right, okay, I'm here backstage at the Rickettone Theatres <laughs> with Mud Honey. And we're just going over some of the finer parts of their European tour. So night after night, another hotel room, another backstage. Are you getting tired of the rock and roll life at all, Mr. Mud Honey people? Here's a fucking band that got it right. It was like the coolest thing I've heard since like 
fun house as far as that kind of rock goes. I mean, Steve and Mark's fuzzy guitars together fucking sounded awesome. Their ability to kind of connect the 60s to 80s punk rock. And there's a very 60s sounding band. They don't get a lot of credit for that. There's a certain amount of chaos happening because Steve's guitar tone is so distorted but in a beautiful way, just the perfect way. Distorted guitar that was like a jagged knife ripping through like a whale's belly. And then the guts come out with Mark's voice when he's screaming. I remember when they first started sort of being a little puzzled and going, are you, know, are you sure you want the guitars to be this dirty? You know, I think was probably the only comment I made at the beginning of the session, like, boy, that's pretty dirty, guys. You know, of course, the word, the, the adjective grungy had not occurred to any of us, I think, at that point. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's pretty goddamn uh, grungy. <laughs> the Seattle scene was theirs. Being with them was being chauffeured through town by the mayors. The parties were all fantastic. And it was just a great moment in time. The critics said, well, Mud Honey's this and blah 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 and they're unsuccessful because they didn't have the success of Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and it's like, fuck you. That's a fucking amazing band. They were the, the powder cake. They were the first great Seattle quote unquote grunge band. No pretensions, no big egos, no hassle. Just uh, having a good time all the time. They are the people who would be watching them. That's what makes them an incredibly honest band. They got nice pants. Amazing vintage guitars. Yeah, good equipment, good hairdo a lot of the time. Amazing songs, um, and they love to drink. They would just pour beer and fill up everybody's glasses, and you'd have the funnest fucking time you could ever imagine. Everybody was welcome, actually, in the dressing room to party. We had like seven crates of beer and four bowls of strong liquor, and it would be gone before they would go on. So you feel that you can communicate to the public uh, regardless of any, any language barrier? Well, I think the penis is international. Dealing with those guys, you've always kind of knew that you would, you would get them aboard of an idea, but then they would take the idea and do it completely their own way. So there was a cheesy soundtrack that was coming out. It's a scene where a guy is running through a college campus. So they wrote a song called Run Shithead Run, and, and then they sent it off to the filmmaker. So that song is on the soundtrack and every once in a while we get these nice little you know 50 cent royalty checks for a song called run shithead run that was the last soundtrack we did <laughs> they also were certainly leaders in sort of sculpting Seattle rock and roll history, from fashion to the music. Take away Montani, nothing would have happened. Nothing. I honestly believe that because they got people from beyond the Pacific Northwest interested. They, they really kind of inspired us to like play hard or yeah. you know they really we going on after them was so hard all the time because yeah. they had so much yeah. energy I mean it was these two guys with these shitty guitars rocking just rocking out but they're on a trampoline dude the set would start they'd jump around and flail their guitars about I'd see Mark bend all the way backwards to where he was on his knees and all the way back and then come back up and they're like flying around the stage like a bunch of marionettes. They reached a kind of apotheosis where everybody in the crowd had like a epiphanic moment where the future of music was revealed just for a moment.
it really motivated a lot of musicians and photographers and producers and you name it. They were just a motivational force. Even in Seattle where you had this gold rush for, you know, two, three, four years, this intense attention of media, record companies, business. You know, the guys in Mudhoney were kind of seen as stable as guys who actually had their shit together. I worked with a lot of other bands. They get together for sound check. When it's done, they all go their separate ways, and then they come back together for the show. The Mudhoney guys, uh, except for the odd occasion where someone's got a friend in town or something like that and a reason to go off on their own, they all just basically stick together, and they are. I, mean, I think that they're some of the best of friends, I guess, put it that way. I'm a creep, yeah, and I'm a jerk. Come on, touch me, I'm sick. Mark Arm, you just played Pukle Pop. What next? I want to get high. Well, I think my voice is basically genetic. I moved here when I was four years old. Before that, I'd been living in Germany on an Air Force base. I just kind of, I guess, felt like kind of a outsider or foreigner or strange. You know, music was always around. Uh, my mom was an opera singer whose career got kind of cut off because of the Second World War. She was in Germany and, you know, kind of at the time that her career would have been taking off, uh, that's when the, uh, the war broke out. You know, I gravitated towards rock and roll. There was music that was kind of forbidden in my household. So that was like another kind of thing that was, was another attraction to it. And my parents had a Volkswagen and the great thing about Volkswagen Bugs in those days was you could just go into them and turn on the radio and it would work. So I would listen to like a top 40 radio station at the time. I hoped to hear, you know, the kind of more rockin' songs. As a kid getting into punk rock, uh, I kept like reading about and hearing about this band, The Stooges. The third album, Raw Power, you could find as a cutout. It was like three dollars or something like that. But the first two records were impossible to find. And I finally found them in a small record store in Oregon. I bought the first one, listened to it a ton, and then like a week or two later, when I had enough money again, bought Funhouse, and it was like, holy crap. You know, like, this is, this is it. Mr. Rep had been a, uh, kind of an imaginary band in high school, named after a math teacher. The full name of the band was Mr. Rep and the Calculations. At some point, it kind of turned into a real band where we actually bought instruments, and we were just get feedback and think we were Jimi Hendrix. You know, like the part in live Jimi Hendrix records between the songs. <laughs> oh, no! To kind of promote Mr. Up, I wrote a letter to the editor uh, from the point of view of someone who had gone to see Mr. Up and thought they were crap. You know, I think I said something like, they're pure shit, pure grunge. You know, that's not the first use of the word grunge to describe music. In Australia, in the early 80s, Bands like The Scientists and The Beasts of Bourbon, those bands were called grunge by the press down there. Tex Perkins at one point was called the High Priest of Grunge, which apparently caused Tex to punch that guy in the face. But what we've all heard about is the so-called grunge rock from Seattle. Grunge is not a term Seattleites are particularly fond of. You know, when all that shit was going on, I said, yeah, it's your fault. You fucking invented grunge, you know? You didn't label the genre, but I think you just, just in describing the sound. And then from there, someone said, well, that's the genre reference we'll use. And at the time, no one accepted it. Everyone thought, what? Grunge is stuff that gets on your dishes that you try to scrub off. If he coined the word, God bless him, he should be getting royalties. Um, if he didn't, I think he should consider himself lucky <laughs> because it's a nasty word and I think it actually became kind of an epithet. 
It was a way to very briskly, conveniently, and almost dismissively describe a style of music that I think had much deeper roots in discontent. You know, people, when they think of grunge, they think of, like, heavy, like a lot of trees and a lot of rain, and I was gonna say mud. <laughs> I mean, it was just essentially a different way of saying punk rock, I guess. Yo, just because you're nerd rock doesn't mean you're smarter than us. Well, look, see these glasses? Steve uh, invented kind of being a hip nerd back in the 80s, 90s. It was not cool to be a nerd, but Steve was like an intellectual. Uh, Steve Turner was called the uh, Eric Clapton of grunge in Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> the Eric Clapton of grunge. <laughs> the next records, if still to this day, kind of like goes against the guitar solo whenever you can. A lot of his old solos were almost like lampooning the idea of a guitar solo. They were anti-solos. <laughs> My brother had an acoustic guitar, and he had the Beatles songbooks um, and the Eagles. Learned how to, you know, sing and play Rocky Raccoon and Desperado in eighth grade. And then I didn't touch a guitar again until uh, uh, a couple years later, after I'd gotten into punk rock a little bit. You know, Black Flag and Devo kind of showed up at the same time. That summer, they came to Seattle, and that was my first rock concert I got to go see. And that was huge because they used, you know, skaters in their videos. All the skateboarders around Seattle went to it, you know, so it was this huge, you know, thing. That's why my parents figured they could allow me to go, because they figured a group of 10 skaters couldn't possibly get into any trouble. <laughs> the punk scene was just so different from what I thought it was going to be like, you know. And they seemed so much smarter and cooler to me than uh, any other group I'd seen so far, as far as, like, at gatherings, you know, social gatherings. Steve and I, early on, had a kind of a musical kinship. He was one of the few people who, when he met me, said he actually liked Mr. Up. <laughs> I joined a band called Splui Numa, and I, I left that after just like a couple practices because they told me I had to get all new gear. The guitar player was a real tech guy. He looked at my amp, said nope. Looked at my guitar, said nope. <laughs> no, this is good enough. So then right after that, that summer, I joined Mr. Up with Mark. The first time I met Mark Arm, I saw Green River, and uh, it was a pretty, pretty awesome show. It was at the Central, and I remember walking up to him and saying, uh, man, that was a great show, dude. I got some pot. You want to go smoke some? At the time, the Green River Killer was in all the headlines. I think it was just trying to be as provocative as we could be, and in retrospect, it's regrettable. It's what you do when you're 20 years old and obnoxious. And I remember the first time I saw them, I was like, holy cow, like, what is Mark doing? He really was able to, to sort of express himself and, and let out his angst. I mean, they went from being folks that I'd seen around town and who I'd do shifts with to being like rock heroes. There was a lot of stuff that went in to what made Green River who they were. Some of the components were this kind of glammy metal. You know, he definitely took that stage persona through into Mud Honey, sort of minus the sequin pants. <laughs> I do remember going to check out the early Green River shows and being really kind of blown away by them. Steve Turner was in Green River at the time. We didn't really know Jeff Ament that well, but we'd seen him play with Deranged Diction, who we thought were cool, and he jumped really high and played through distortion. It seemed very important to us at the time. So Steve kind of went on this campaign to get to know Jeff by getting a job at the same espresso place that he <laughs> worked at. I could tell that Mark and Steve were, were into music and into kind of making something happen, so. I went to a couple practices. That's how Green River started. The Rehab Doll album by uh, Green River was the first record that Jonathan and I put out on Sub Pop in spring of 88. We emptied our coffers of about, I think, $5,000, which was like a, a massive fortune for us at the time. Now I won't mind. 
And unfortunately, as soon as the band handed us the master tape, they told us they were breaking up. So that was kind of our, our grand opening release. And we realized we were probably going to go out of business within a month. We're down in LA opening up for uh, Jane's Addiction and Junkyard. And I remember Stone and I were up on the side of the stage watching Jane's Addiction just going like, oh my God, this is like incredible. And I remember Mark and Bruce coming up at different times saying like how lame they thought it was. And I remember thinking, wow. I think any hope that I had that, well, I, you know, that I thought that while well, Green River could be as good as Jane's Addiction because Mark didn't like Jane's Addiction. For me, that, that felt like there was a big chasm there. I remember just being like kind of bummed. Like Whether people say it, Jane's Addiction split him up, it's like, it was just a moment in time where it sort of became more evident. And then when they split into Mother Love Bone and Mud Honey, uh, there was no doubt that we were going to work with Mud Honey. The separation that sort of launched Mud Honey, which is fantastic from a marketing point of view, it's like, you know, the two sellouts went one direction and the purists, <laughs> the purists went the other and we've got the purists and, and they had a fantastic band, you know, I mean, Mud Honey was fantastic. We saluted them as soon as we saw them. We were like, wow, that's so much better than Green River was. Green River broke up, I was like, hmm, what am I going to do now? The first thought that occurred to me was like, maybe I should call Steve. He was going to school up in Bellingham at the time, and I called him and I was like, hey, Green River broke up. Why don't you drop out of school? <laughs> That is the day, New Year's Day 1988, that we mark as the beginning of the band. It's like the band's birthday. The night before, everybody was uh, kind of converging on the Seattle Center to go to the Coliseum to see Motorhead open up for Alice Cooper. Matt was coming into town for that show, so we figured, okay, we'll get together the next day uh, with Matt. It was really not a whole lot of thought. We weren't like auditioning or, you know, there was very little, little thought to like, it came together really easily. I was 20 at this point, so I couldn't buy beer. I walk in to the store with Matt, you know, just kind of meeting him and I'm like, hey, you know, want to buy me some beer? I'll give you some money. And he's like, yeah. And I give him some money and, he, and he's like, well, he grabs himself a half case of beer. He's like, well, I got mine. And I'm like, ooh, you know, he's got his, and it was a half case of beer. And I'm like, well, can he get me one too? I knew of him just from other bands he was in, but I never really personally met him until I was in a car with him being taken to practice. And he steps in the back seat with me and, hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> he was wearing a beret. <laughs> That's another thing I forgot about until just now. He was wearing a beret, and I'm like, oh, what's up with this drummer? <laughs> but I fell in love with him. <laughs> Mud honey can influence your very life. A rewarding experience that you shall never forget. Steve and I were very into B movies, psychotronic movies. One of those directors that we really liked was Russ Myers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to sex. You have just witnessed some scenes from Russ Myers' sadistically sensual motion picture, Mud Honey, a taste of evil. I thought like, wow, you know, that's a pretty cool name and kind of stored it, you know, like, if I ever have an, another band, that might be a really good name to use. <laughs> you better get your hands out of there. You, you, you're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> I haven't seen it for so long. It's the one with the preacher talking in black and white and spouting off all sorts of uh, biblical nonsense. And there's a, a buxom blonde white trash kind of lady running around the swamps, right? There's a preacher. I don't, you know, I don't know. It's boobs. <laughs> I don't remember much of it other than that. <laughs> Seriously. For a taste of evil, see Mud Honey. I, I remember Mark saying that he introduced himself, I think, to Dan Peters and, and told him he should join Mud Honey by pushing in front of him at some Seattle club in the queue for the toilet so he could vomit. And it was just like, we were starting a new band, it's called Mud Honey, like that, you know. 
Dan Peters, greatest fucking drummer in the world. Nobody sounds like Dan Peters. You can hear drumming on anything, even if he's like, you know, he's on a Mark Lanigan record or whatever sessions he's done. You can always tell in about two seconds, that's Dan Peters on the drums. I recognize that feel. I recognize that drum fill. I can totally tell by the way he's hitting the snare drum. Danny is completely unique. My mom was a lounge singer. She uh, uh, had bands and sang six, seven nights a week. I got my first pair of drumsticks at a fairly early age. I used to sit around and just kind of act like I had a drum set in front of me. My uncle was in a band, and the singer of that band told me he had an extra drum set. A band like Gang of Four really changed the way you know I thought of music and listened to music. X, Dead Kennedys. My math teacher, you know, knew that I had listened to punk rock, so that's kind of this weird guy. He asked me to bring in some punk rock to play for the class. I'm like, oh, all right, I'll, I'll do that. And, and I made a cassette tape of a, a Dead Kennedy song. And uh, so the whole class is sitting down, getting ready. They're like, you hey, know, Dan's going to play you some punk rock. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be good. You know, so I uh, press play. The song starts up. You know. Like the lyrics are like, you know, I don't need this fucking world. I don't need this fucking world. You know, this world gets me down. And the teacher's like, okay, Dan, stop. <laughs> and I'm like, eh, well, you wanted to hear it. I don't need this fucking world. This world breaks me down. One beer down, and he's fucking going to snap. <laughs> what? Nothing. Look at this. I got a disease last night. Where'd you, where'd you get that at? I don't know. I had a bunch of open sores on my hand. I was rolling around on my floor. I passed out. I go, somebody diseased me. Matt Lucan was the mud in the honey. The guy had a brilliant and surreal sense of humor. He was a work of art. I woke up at about 11 o'clock in the morning and came down, and he was sitting in front of the TV, smoking, taking hits out of a bong, and watching an ACDC video. <laughs> and I thought, this is exactly what I would imagine Almost too much so, like, a car, like he staged it. But he was serious, he wasn't joking. He, that's what he did. <laughs> His whole family said, don't go into the music business. Don't do it, you know, get a job, become a carpenter. So pretty soon he was like, yeah, yeah, they didn't want me to be a musician, but I'm the first fucking looking who ever made it to Europe, to Japan, to Australia, whatever. So he was the first looking going around the world, being a rock star. And this is Matt Lukin right there for you. <laughs> Some crazy guy. Amazing guy. As a young kid, I remember playing singles of like Black Sabbath and shit like that. But it scared me at the same time. <laughs> but um, when I got older, I was like, yeah, this is the stuff. <laughs> and I didn't really get into guitar till I was like about 13 or 14. And I got one, I'd sit there and pluck away. We were just friends or whatever, hanging out. The guy who played bass was the cousin of the drummer, but he would rarely show up, but he had a bass and an amp. And I'd be there with my guitar, but it's like, well, there's no one here to play bass. Why don't you play bass? Buzz's girlfriend played bass and she replaced me, so that was pretty much, uh, since I didn't have a pussy, <laughs> I was no longer needed in the band. <laughs> he found a bass player that had a pussy and <laughs> fuck him. <laughs> then when I joined Mudhoney, I was like, this stuff's fucking great. It's just, just good rock and roll, which is all anybody wants anyway, isn't it? It's just good rock. I was working at a Japanese restaurant, and uh, this chef there seemed like he'd already been through the punk wars and, you know, had gone, you know, pop, sort of, and was into kind of synth pop stuff. I was talking about guitar, and I was like, yeah, I just can't really get it to sound the way I want it to, you know? And he asked me what distortion box I was using, and I didn't know what that was. I was like, huh? He just kind of smiled, and the next day, he handed me a Superfuzz. 
I said, here, try this. It was a serious revelation, because uh, it's not just a distortion box, it's, it's fuzz, you know, it's like really, really deep, thick fuzz. And so that just, you know, blew my mind. By the time that Mudhoney started, I was playing the Big Muff because it had more of that sustained, kind of like blue cheer, Stooges kind of thing going. And so Mark used the Super Fuzz. Thing ain't sweet no more. So here's the original 8 track reel, and inside is what passes for a track sheet at that point in my career. I think I'd only been a recording engineer for maybe a year and a half. When we did that single, we really wanted to put like our best foot forward. This is our chance to make a statement, and we didn't really know if we were going to do anything more in that first single. So we're like, we're gonna put our two best songs on it and that'll be it. And that could be the only document that this band would ever have. You know, here's the initial salvo. It's kind of the opening salvo of grunge in a lot of ways. I think people would look at it that way now. What you're going to hear about today is nothing short of a miracle. It's dramatically new. That's the apotheosis of what rock and roll should sound like. Yeah, I'm a jerk. Yeah, touch me, I'm sick is a pretty extraordinary thing to say. Touch me, I'm sick. You think, you know, there are eight million ways to say I love you or I don't love you in rock and roll. Touch me, I'm sick. That was, that was one I hadn't heard before. It was exciting and vital. It sounded really punk as fuck, too. That record was so in demand that they flew out the door. One of those classic singles that captured the times. It did not get on radio in any kind of widespread way. It was something that the insiders, the know-it-alls knew. But it really had a strong viral effect to the point now that it is in its own way a hit. As a label, we really tried to work the collector's market, doing uh, colored vinyl editions of all the 45s. We worked with Erica Records for weeks, getting samples of uh, a good shit brown. You know, and they'd send us like, uh, kind of like a veiny purple, a baby shit brown. And we were like, no, 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 no. This has got to be a firm, adult, dog shit brown. We finally got it. Here's a little known fact. I remember Jonathan and Steve and I went out to lunch and um, the I whole idea for the Sub Pop Singles Club came out during a conversation about record collecting and how we could sell more records. And Steve was probably the deepest record collector of anybody in the band. I mean, I remember the first record I bought uh, when I, I was in first or second grade, I bought an Elvis Presley record uh, for 25 cents at a garage sale. I still have that record. You know, the two things that have kind of remained with me, it's pretty easy. I, I love punk rock, I love folk music. One of my all-time heroes, Rocky Erickson. Monochrome set, he's Frank. A live version of Hospital by Jonathan Richman. Tum Water, uh, these are, are beer ads from the 70s, like little tiny snippets, little songs about beer. <laughs> first Mud Honey single. The super limited, just a handful of weird colors made, because uh, they had they were trying to make up for the fact that they were so late, and they kept fucking up all the orders.
The saddest thing about all these singles, the sleeve that they uh, put them in, stained them, made this horrible like staining. I don't know if you can see that anyway. It's a crime against a record though. Somehow like they chemically don't mix with the vinyl, the sleeves, very sad. So they're all uh, downgraded, unfortunately, from Mint Minus to DG Plus. <laughs> we were just kind of hobbling along. We had run out of cash. Uh, that summer, Jonathan and I went to the New Music Seminar, which is a big conference in New York City. Spent the last few cents we had going to that conference. Amazingly, we met up with uh, a German promoter. And the next thing you know, Mudhoney, Bruce, and myself were given tickets to go to Berlin at the end of October. Hey, we're Mudhoney, we're from Seattle. That was really exciting because, you know, we hadn't been anywhere really. You know, we just got flown in to play one show to Berlin. I mean, to us, it seemed like a complete joke. Like, now who's paying for this and why, <laughs> you know? Playing that show was a huge break for Mud Honey and also a huge break for Sub Pop. It was fucking surreal, man, on, on every level. People got it. I mean, in many ways, they got it much more than people outside of Seattle. Did. I was driving up to Seattle. There was a show that night, a band called Mud Honey were playing. I was just minding my own business. I was behind this chick that had a, a, a skeleton thing hanging from her rear view mirror. I remember thinking, ooh, you know, <laughs> an alternative chick, you know, maybe she's cute. Pulled up alongside of her, it was Matt Lucan. <laughs> and I would say that Bob Whitaker, their manager, was kind of like the fifth member of Mud Honey. He was an integral part to the whole Mud Honey vibe. He'd be playing shows and there'd be some kind of ruckus, you know, and like some drunk guy in the corner, like, you know, doing something that he shouldn't be doing. Who the hell is that guy? Like, oh, well, that's our manager. You know, it's like, <laughs> you're gonna be paying him later. <laughs> Everything Mud Honey did was kind of casual, kind of um, non-industry oriented. Bob was their manager, and I think that they split everything evenly with him, like he was a band member, which is not your traditional industry practice. They kind of bucked the system, so to speak. French Frank. And me, this is the white piece of Gilbert. You're the first band I ever met where the manager is more out of control than the band. <laughs> yeah, he would definitely throw gasoline on all kinds of fires. <laughs> it was both crazy. Totally crazy. Who said the bomb? What the fuck is going on in here? Uh, no when we went on our first U.S. tour, we brought him along kind of as entertainment. And more often than not, like every, you, you would get shit-faced and heckle us from the crowd. Matt Lucan doing what he does best, you fucking dick. You may not have even seen him, even though it's hard to miss him, because he's kind of like the punk rock big bird. You know, I was a little butt rocker with bad corkscrew hair. It was such a great opportunity for me, college dropout, go see the world. He was, you know, drafted in to be our roadie. You know, the joke is, if you asked him to help carry an amp or guitar, he'd like, carry it yourself. <laughs> That's not mine. <laughs> no, 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 Bob didn't lift a finger moving anything. He'd just look at you and go, fuck you, you got two legs, you go do it. Like, dude, I need to add someone to the guest list. Fuck you, go to the front door and do it yourself. It's like, no, man, you work for us, you're supposed to do it. Ah, fuck you, you do it. But he was really great at um, finding a place to stay. Because like back when you can't afford hotels, the best place to stay is to find college girl who's living in a house that her parents are paying for that's really nice or whatever. He was really good at finding those kind of people. They had a lot of room and a really nice house, as opposed to finding the punk rock house that's <laughs> just full of piss and cockroaches to stay in. I think the band and myself mutually had, you know, uh, contempt for a lot of the industry standards. I can remember it on a flight one time. I, I just said, hey, you guys, you know, managers are creepy. Let me be your creepy manager. 
But I just said, you know, I think I could shoulder this load without screwing things up too much. I can be your point guy. You know, he kind of grew with us as the machine kind of grew and uh, slowly took on more and more responsibilities. And he took it real seriously. I mean, really, you know, he was learning as we were going too. you know, as we all were. I was a good candidate because I'm relatively articulate and I'm ultimately very concerned about the band and, and uh, their credibility and not talk them into something they don't want. And, and so it was a pretty comfortable transition. For me, part of what makes a record great is how it captures the time in which it's presented. Uh, this is our B-side to our number one hit in England called Superbus Big Mom. It almost immediately entered the indie charts in England, which was something that never happened. American records never made the indie charts in England. It was, a, it was very rare, and it stayed there for over a year. You know, it instantly became the party record. To this day, I think it's the greatest EP that we've ever put out. I had been, you know, a professional recording engineer for less than two years at that point. Now, what is it, you know, 23 years I've been doing this? You know, I've made like, what, 350 some albums in 10 countries or whatever and this shit keeps coming back <laughs> Mark just like hurling towards the camera with their hair flailing and then just it looked like Mud Honey written in amazing magic marker and Superfuzz Big Muff written underneath. I challenge anyone sit down make Superfuzz a better record than it is. The only way you can do it is to just make it longer somehow. You think of some of the greatest lines in rock and roll. That line, that fucking Oh God, how I love to hate. Fuck. I wish I wrote that. That's the coolest fucking line. Oh God, how I love to hate. Oh God, how I love to hate! They were tapping into these reference points, B-movies. There's this kind of kitschy, trashy thing going on. It's kind of a bit shit. Those films are a bit shit. People who act in them are a bit shit because they're the, the cheapest actors they could get. But there is this sort of quality to it. And I feel like a lot of what Modern Honey were doing was tapping into that. Like, they weren't shit, but like, they were tapping into these reference points. That's the Lenny Kravitz song. There's a tractor in my balls with Lenny Kravitz in your head. Oh, we know yeah. Sonic Youth. Oh, <laughs> amazing uh, Has anybody vomited yet? Mark did. We're not going to have a good time until everybody vomits. And we asked him to play with us when we were coming out to do a West Coast tour and um, never having seen them or really anything. You know, with the uh, Sonic Youth stamp of approval at that time, it was a big thing. And they were always happy. I mean, they were always just kind of like, you know, eating and drinking and smoking cigarettes and just like rolling up to the sound check and just spilling out of the van and like wrestling on the pavement. Their whole thing was like, let's just have a really good time. So it was kind of an interesting pairing, you know, because we were kind of a little older and we were sort of like these egghead kind of book collectors. Yeah, didn't they make fun of, like, they said something once about us just like reading in a van all the time or something. Right. What book are you reading? When they'd come off stage, we'd be in the dressing room all drunk, <laughs> entertaining them with whatever, just being degenerates. I think they needed to probably drink a bit more and party a bit more to make it more fun for them. They seem to be into buying books and stuff. <laughs> Good people, though. One of the most famous Mudhoney gigs in London was the, the gig at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Mudhoney were headlining, and they were supported by Soundgarden. All of the British press at that show. So there were like at least 200 people, press people on the guest list. We played first. We played a great set. 
I love the set. I remember the songs that we played and the sequence with which we played them, and they were, they were, it was really strong. There's nowhere else in our history that we ever could have had Soundgarden open for us. <laughs> you know, that was like the one day. <laughs> kind of weird. We get up there, and there's just this weird energy in the air. You, you could def definitely sense there's a lot of anticipation. Sometimes you need a, a collective of people to be in the same room together to realize how they all feel about it and to be excited about how they all feel about it. Because up until then, you know, people had been hearing the stuff on the radio, people had been buying the records, but until you, you actually saw the band live, you never really get a sense of how you all feel about it and how exciting and empowering that can be. Mark Arm always had these cynical, wise ass jokes, he decided to ask, I would like to invite everybody on stage. They did. Well, we called it the friendly riot. It's, you know, this was the arrival of grunge mania. An out of control good time. But the next day, all you heard about, you know, in the press was how great Mud Honey was. I was bummed that we were a footnote in the reviews. That really established Sub Pop in Seattle and uh, Mud Honey in Europe. That started the whole thing, especially in England. The basic feeling was we were still cruising under the radar, and nobody really knew, except for us, just how big the scene had gotten. So it was with that intention that we said, we're going to do a show in the moor. And not only are we going to do a show in the moor, we're going to sell it out. I just thought they were crazy. Nirvana at that point was barely known. Tad had something out. The bands had all been playing these little clubs, the Rainbow Tavern, the Central. There's a club around the corner called the Ditto. These are all rooms that held a couple hundred people. Playing the more at that time, not opening for somebody, but actually headlining at the more, that was seen to be a pretty big accomplishment. We knew how popular these bands had become in town, and we wanted to uh, strut our stuff a little bit, wake people up. Needless to say, the venue sold out. People went crazy. It was total mayhem. So close to now it was no longer just people in this core group of musicians and fans that, that was always the Seattle scene. It's now reaching out to the suburbs. that really got the attention of the main writers for the local papers. He couldn't be ignored after that show. After the show, word on the street was that Seattle was just blowing up. They had a relentless release schedule, and that was our whole whole strategy of attack, was to just keep putting something out. And that built to the album, and the album did great. The thing that I remember the most, we work radio right before records come out. It came in as a CMJ number one added record, and that we had a number one record at CMJ was a huge, huge fucking deal. That was at the height of hair metal. It was at the height of so many things that were considered to be the cultural rule. And yet what they were doing up there was like, fuck it, you know, whatever you're doing out there has nothing to do with what we're doing in here. We ramped up our marketing efforts, did some videos. You know, it was like a grown up independent rock record marketing spree.
down my street. I was quickly kind of underwhelmed by it, you know, after it was done. It was kind of more of the same as Super Fuzz, maybe without the urgency. Like, there's some really good songs on there, I think. You know, Super Fuzz being a six song EP is really concise and to the point. There's no filler on it. You know, we don't write an album and go like, this song is filler, but you know, after a while you kind of can step back and go like, you know, maybe that song isn't quite as good as this one. Okay, well that was, you know, the sophomore slump. We didn't raise the bar any. Is it true you want to break up now? Why? I mean, what uh, what's gonna be the future for grunge rock and things? Um, I don't know. I, Steve's going back to school, so um, and Dan's gonna play drums for Nirvana, so me and Mark are just gonna I don't know something might come along. There'll be other bands in Seattle still. Hmm. There's still good bands there. I'm sure I'll play music of some sort, you know, for all my life. But uh, I've never wanted to be like a rock star or like a professional musician, really. I guess I always played in bad punk rock bands, and uh, that's what I intend to keep doing. We're not really saying we're breaking up, because you never know. We might be back together, you know, at some point. You know, at the time when the band was, you know, doing really, really well, Steve decided that he wanted to go back to school. You know, when the band started, I mean, our initial thing was like, we're going to be lucky to get a single out. We accomplished that. At the time, it seemed like most bands had three good years in them. Steve was more than anybody else, I think, kind of really married to that idea. And so I think he probably just thought like, well, you know, this is the thing that I'm doing at this point in my life, and I'm going to eventually go back to school and get that anthropology degree and go become a professor somewhere or something. I don't know. I still could not imagine music being, you know, a living. I don't think I wanted it, really, and I think I was in denial that it could have been. I know I didn't like the record very much, just wanted to distance ourselves from what was becoming known as the grunge thing in Seattle. I had run into the girlfriends of Kurt and Chris at a show, and they had told me Nirvana was looking for a new drummer. Chad wasn't gonna be in the band anymore. I'm like, well, you know, I'm not gonna be doing anything for a while. Let them know that I'd you know, like to play with them and if they're interested. I had played a, a show with them right, at the Motorsports International Garage. It was a big show for them in town. There was supposed to be a photo shoot the next day after that show for the cover of Sounds Magazine. I went to Tacoma and did the photo shoot, and then they took off and went to talk to labels. When the, they got back from that, Kurt gave me a call, and he's like, hey, it looks like we're going to sign the Geffen. And I'm like, yeah, all right, you know, and it's like, I'm like, so what's happened with that uh, English tour? He's like, oh yeah, that's why I'm calling, you know. It's like, we uh, got another drummer. I'm like, oh. Turned out to be, of course, Dave, who was at the show that I played, who was at the photo session that I, I did with those guys. They all knew full well at the time that I was not gonna be in the band, but didn't say anything. The great thing that happened after the, the Nirvana thing didn't work out is I ended up playing drums for the Screaming Trees for like almost a year or half a year or something. And that was great. You know, we were still practicing and, and you know, writing songs. You know, I'm like, Steve, what the fuck's going on? You know, what do you got, what's, you know, I, I, the trees want to go in and record a new record and they want to continue touring and stuff. And, you know, what's up? And he's like, uh, I think we should tour. And I'm like, all right. So, I mean, I, that was easy choice for me to go back to Mud Honey. Energy and the, the vibe and stuff, it's just, you couldn't beat it. I stopped playing with the trees and, you know, of course they went on to make, you know, one of their most successful records of all time as well. <laughs> Apparently if I join a band but don't play on their record, it'll, they're going to go off and maybe have, you know, some good success, so. Well, for Sub Pop, 1991 was the make or break year, and uh, I believe it was in the early summer of 91 that John and I basically laid off everybody. We'd come in the office and pack up a box of records to ship to Japan and maybe get a couple hundred dollars and we were really on our last legs when uh, Every Good Boy Deserves Fudge came out 
if it wasn't for that release, there's a very good chance that, you know, we would have folded the company. Sub Hop has always been very grateful to Mud Honey for staying with us like they did. Every Good Boy Deserves Fudge, to me, may be the defining work that Mud Honey has released. And I know I'm not alone in that thought. That record married their wit, their songwriting skills, but there was a level of sophistication, but equal parts sophistication and dinge. It's another word for grunge. And just fucking great jams. At that time, selling 100,000 albums on an indie label was, uh, that didn't happen too often. That was like going platinum. And we were very proud of the record because it was such an awesome disc. They can make it sound so nice. Everybody's got a oh. I think it's a really good record, and it was a good change of direction. You know, at that time, I was doing a lot more dope, and I think Steve definitely picked up the slack and kind of drove that record. I guess it kind of gets tagged more of a garage punk kind of record. We had stripped things down and simplified things a little bit. Also because it was a pretty crude eight-track studio at the time. If Mark had the farfisa on the song, there couldn't be a second guitar. <laughs> But it wasn't enough for the company to be in the black. They had an enormous amount of patience with us because even though we knew what we were doing or what we were trying to do, those guys didn't sign on to uphold that. You know, they, they were our friends and they believed in us and they believed in the vision of the label to a certain degree. But, you know, they had their own interests to manage and maintain. You know, leaving Sub Pop was rough. It wasn't uh, something that I, I'm proud of or happy about doing. It just seemed really unloyal to me to leave. It was getting uncomfortable. And we started worrying that, you know, they were going to go out of business owing us, you know, 75,000 bucks or something. And it was really going to, like, destroy any kind of friendships. I think us leaving, you know, kind of ruined the friendships anyway, kind of, you know, but I don't think there's any way around it. What ended up happening was it got the company to a point where it could survive just a little bit longer and then Nevermind happened. And it ended up being Nevermind that kind of pushed the company really into a better financial place where they could kind of regroup and figure out what the plan was. If we had known that Sub Pop was going to be kept afloat by Nirvana signing to a major label, I don't think we would have left the label. You know, we probably would have just kind of like weathered the storm and waited till that happened. But of course, we didn't know that was going to happen. Sub Pop was distributed at the time by a record label in New York called Caroline Records. So we thought, well, maybe we'll just cut out the middleman. President of the label came out. His name was Keith something or other. I wish I could totally remember the name just because people like this need to have their names. They need to be called out, right? He took us to a nice lunch, started telling us what we could and could not do if we signed to Caroline. He said we would have to tour for nine months out of the year. That's what Smashing Pumpkins were doing and it was really helping them. It's like, why are you even comparing us to Smashing Pumpkins? You know, it's like, come on. Talked about how you need to polish up those guitar sounds and stuff. And how like, we needed to do a few more records before we could become a major label band. We needed to work on sweetening up our sound and <laughs> shit like that. That's all we've got. It's our guitar sound, you know. You want us to totally lose like our identity? You stupid asshole. So we thought, if this is what an independent label is gonna throw at us, we might as well 
meet with major labels and see what they have to say. Major labels basically had to admit they had no idea what was going to be popular with the youngsters anymore. They had lost complete control when Nirvana hit big, you know, that just changed everything. Like they were, oh, we don't know why this is popular. We have no idea what's going on now. All the majors said the same thing. Oh, we're going to come out with guns blazing. We're going to have all these advertising. You're going to get the most support, blah, blah, blah. The Mud Honey guys are all very savvy dudes, and they're very quick reads of personalities. You just kind of knew immediately that it's like, this is not going to work. <laughs> We're trying to capture audience interest and soften them up so that the salesman can suck them with a good old hard sell. We were not looking to start a bidding war because we didn't want to get into kind of a trap where we like owed somebody a shitload of money. And we went with David Katznelson at Reprise because both the label and he seemed like the most reasonable people out there that we'd met with. Yeah, Dave just seemed to be cooler and outgoing and a fun guy. And I was really, really nervous. Um, I was still in a period of time in my career where whenever I would talk to a band, I was always the younger person. I was always the fan. And I was always a person who was like, I really, should I even be here? I mean, who am I to be talking to these guys? The first person I met was, was Bob Whitaker. And Bob uh, was a larger than life figure. You know, he would take me to his place and, you know, sit me in this uh, huge dentist chair that he had and start throwing all these records of what was going on in the scene while plying me with alcohol. And then while we were doing that, trying to talk business with me at the same time. And I was uh, doing everything I could, everything I could possibly do to keep focused and keep, you know, attempting to, uh, to, to keep on, on, on target of what I was trying to do, what I was up there trying to do. When we met with Warner Brothers, I was really concerned because, you know, the replacements and Husker Du had both signed to Sire and Warner Brothers. And all of a sudden, once they got on the major label, their record sounded way slicker. I think the band itself was really worried about having to go to a major label. The, the typical stuff, going to a major label, being changed. And, uh, and these are all things that were on their minds when they were talking to me. I asked Lenny Warnocker, who was the president at the time, like, why did you do this to these bands? And he was like, we didn't do anything to these bands. They just did what they wanted to do. And I'm sure the bands probably thought, well, if we record a slicker record, then it's more likely to get radio airplay and stuff like this. You know, so we intentionally went to the exact same basement studio that we did our previous record to kind of prove a point that, you know, we're just because we're on a major label, we're not going to like compromise our sound. There was so much excitement about the movement that they were a part of and them themselves that it was really unstoppable. Once we were on a major label and the contracts were signed, we realized we had these budgets for every record. We found out that what we didn't use of the recording budget in the studio, we actually got to keep. Rather than going to the Bahamas and recording at Compass Point or whatever you're supposed to do with your $200,000, their thing was to keep the money and just use some of it to record with. And then we would spend 20 of it or whatever recording the record, you know, and then you could pocket the rest. We're punks. <laughs> We're rebels. <laughs> <laughs> Marks uh, owed to the Seattle scene at the time. It's it was recorded for $62 or $162, I can't remember which. Our attorney at the time told me not to let the label find out how much we paid for the recording of that song that you know was on the platinum soundtrack for singles. Don't let them find out that you paid $162 for that recording because, you know. We, we uh, got a check for a lot more. Well, it's always good to get money. <laughs> I'll get money out of my famous name one way or another. You know, that allowed all of us to eventually make down payments on houses. So that's kind of how we tried to operate each time. All musicians know what it's like to struggle. They bought roofs over their heads. It actually shows what a good survivalist instinct they had. Some of them had stock and stuff like that. It's fun to be a star. It's nice to have a car. Yeah, you'll have to admit that I'll be rich as shit. And I'll just sit and grin. The money will The 
title piece of cake kind of says it all to me. I mean, it's like things that come so easy to this band. We do one single, we're going to Europe. We're going out there with Sonic Youth. You know, we're getting attention straight away. Our whole approach was kind of like, we can do that, that's a piece of cake. Yeah, sure, do another record, piece of cake. You know, and that kind of became our attitude and that was the title that we chose for that record. It was like, yeah, it's no big deal, we're doing this, it's easy. And it shouldn't be. I felt with those guys, when they hit the major label, they just wanted to self-sabotage. And if you listen to Piece of Cake, I mean, it starts off with that little techno blip. We're just annoying. And I think they deliberately did that because it was sort of like a fuck you to being on a major label. You know, even Nirvana, you know, who obviously were a very good band, but they wrote big hooks and, you know, big monster anthems, and Mudhoney never tried to do that, to their own probably financial detriment. With Mudhoney, they came out of the box and they were the number one sales sheeted band of the week and they end up selling 150,000 records the label I think was peachy about that you'd like it Dave <laughs> I do I love it <laughs> the deal that we did with Mud Honey was not the biggest of the offers they got either it was a deal that was designed to um, recoup faster I think they the point structure was a little bit better and their freedoms were a little bit better so selling 150,000 records right off the bat was was pretty damn good my favorite comment on Piece of Cake was from Bruce Pavitt. His thing was like, you know, the record's only as good as its, as its, as its best song, basically. If, if, if it's got that one good song on it, then it's a good record. I think Suck You Dry was a, a rousing success. And I think we had some other stuff on there was really half-baked. And, you know, um, I think Mark likes to take the bulk of the credit for that. Yeah, I was really fucked up a lot of times. I was really fucked up a lot in that period. I was drinking a lot, doing a lot of drugs. That recording session, more than any other one, you know, I was probably showing up like hour, two hours late every day because I was waiting to get drugs before I could go over there. I had seven junkies on my roster at one point, which makes life move very slow for you because um, when you're talking to somebody on the phone who is doing heroin, if you have like three things that you wanna to talk to them about, you might get one of those things through and it'll take seven hours or you know five hours or whatever it might be. And I would be on the phone with Mark a lot where he would pretty much go to sleep on me or something like that. And it was happening since before I got involved with him. Hey, Marty. Yeah. Okay, here. What's that? H. H. What's H? That's a lot. It's heroin. I hate the way in music documentaries, you know, like behind the music or something, that bands, the way, like, people talk about the drug use or whatever, you know, like, the music kind of gets all kind of sappy and things sort of slow down and... You know, it's like this big pivotal point in this musician's career or whatever. You know, to me, when bands like Aerosmith or whatever, they'll like just talk about their deep addiction and they'll kind of glorify it. You know, like the, their Toxic Twins t-shirts with Joe Perry and Steve Tyler, you know, and they're all like, you know, we did mountains of Peruvian blow and did a lot of heroin and just partied like crazy. And then they go, but don't do that, kids. It's really bad. To me, it's kind of embarrassing, you know? It's like, I was a total cliche. I was a rock guy, strung out on heroin, and actually for a while in there, was going out with a stripper. It's like, <laughs> how did this happen to me? <laughs> of course, you know, I, I walked through all those doors myself. When he started doing hard drugs, you know, like a couple of his friends, you know, told me I had to do something about it, you know, or talk to him, and I was like, well, I don't think that's my place, you know. I, you know, I'm, I'm all for personal freedom to, you can fuck yourself up if you want, you know. Um, you know, he's a smart guy, you know. So we never really talked about it much. I think like the first time anyone in Mud Honey uh, caught wind of it that I might be doing it, there was a rumor that I went into the emergency for a drug overdose, and I don't know how that got out, but you know, I OD'd several times. You know, went to the Harbor View emergency. Those guys had heard that and I was just like, what? No way. That's not me. <laughs> you know, people do drugs because they're fun. 
you know, like it's not like it's not always like can be explained away like, oh, they're self-medicating or they have like some kind of, you know, painful something. It's like, well, it's, it's kind of fun. And then it the fun factor gets pushed away because it's a, an addiction, too. And it, and it gets chemically you're just getting more and more fucked up. It really got boring after a while. I was able to, like, go through this period with heroin and come out relatively unscathed. You know, I didn't die. I didn't get AIDS. I did get hepatitis C, you know, which I didn't find out about till many years later. That was like the only thing where like, wow, this shit actually bit me on the ass. After I stopped doing heroin, I was playing in this band, Blood Loss, and one of the members of the band was doing heroin at the time. I remember like people would ask me, man, isn't it really hard to be in a band with this guy, you know, like just after what you've gone through? And it's like, no, it's a reminder of what I don't want to be. You know, it wasn't like, I saw him and was like, man, I'd really like to be like that. It's like, <laughs> I'm so glad I am not that way anymore. You know, it was, uh, and actually that was a real important part of the process for me. Hi, I'm Kurt Loder with an MTV News special report on a very sad day. Kurt Cobain, the leader of one of rock's most gifted and promising bands, Nirvana, is dead. It was a real kick in the pants the entire grunge scene, Seattle scene. No one wanted to know anything more about Seattle and us because it was a, such a sad tale. The only bands from Seattle that, that were doing well that year was like, you know, the Presidents. Moving to the country, I'm gonna eat a lot of peaches. Like they wanted happy music now, you know? <laughs> they didn't want more of, of us, you know? <laughs> You know, we, we were back working with Jack for the record, you know, and um, almost seemed like a restatement of what our sound was. You know, it was, uh, it was grunge, damn it. health issues that had been resolved. There was a whole bunch of new songs that were well rehearsed and seemed well arranged and ready to go. And there was one song on there that Courtney Love thought was about her. Um, so she called the CEO of our company who had worked with Kurt before and, and knew Courtney. We did a record at Reprise, we would go down there. There was always like kind of a courtesy meeting with the president, you know. The band was in the building, was at Warner Brothers in Burbank uh, on that day. And it was Mark Arm's birthday on that day. The cake was being brought to Mark with the candles on it. When I get a call from the CEO, I pick up the phone. He has no idea that Mudhoney's in town. And he's like, you know those Mudhoney guys? And I'm like, um, yeah. And he's like, I never want to see those guys again. I mean, you know, we're putting the record out. I hope it does great, but I never want to talk to those guys again. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, David was like trying to ar arrange the meeting with him. He uh, heard back that there was no way in hell that he was going to meet with us because of the song Into Your Shtick. I never want to meet those guys. I never want to shake their hand. I never want to have my picture taken with them. And Dave told us that. And I'm like, <laughs> really? I go, that bums me out, man, because it's all I've ever wanted to do is have my picture taken with whatever the fuck his name is. Who gives a fuck if you want to meet us or not? Fucking asshole. <laughs> Thanks for the bottle of wine you might have bought me at a dinner sometime, but still, <laughs> fuck you. And he's basically saying, you know, I got a call from Courtney and she's going back into therapy because they made a song about her on this record. Many people think it's directed strictly at Courtney Love. It's a, a much broader shot than that, but she definitely fits. You know, of course, this is a year after Kurt Cobain killed himself. I was pretty angry with how that whole thing went down. The line
wine is so much more about the industry. It's so much more about all those people who take art and try to push it so hard through a, you know, the financial filter. The thing that kind of frustrated me the most about that whole time period was like we did this two week tour with Nirvana and just seeing the way they had organized themselves. A lot of the people that they had hired to uh, work for the band were really gross. Didn't seem like they had anyone in the band's best interest at heart. They just wanted the band to keep going and so more money could be made. And we had uh, a couple of shows with Pearl Jam booked about a month later. And at the time, the perception was Nirvana was the underground band that came up through Sub Pop and Pearl Jam was the, you know, the major label band or whatever. And we were just like, God, if it was, can you imagine how bad it's going to be at, in the Pearl Jam camp if it's like this bad at Nirvana? We went out with Pearl Jam and it was just the fucking exact opposite. You know, every person was like super cool, friendly, helpful. There were people in, in the Nirvana camp who were just like thumping their chests at how proud they were to be working with Nirvana. And there was nothing like that happening over uh, in Pearl Jam world. And, and it was like, oh, you can be at this level and run things in a smart way and you don't have to hire a bunch of dicks. As soon as they were out playing that first show with us and we were like, interacting really for the first time in a few years in, in a real real way i remember thinking like wow this is a really good thing and then when kurt died i think it was really important that we were all together at that time you know i think it was a wake-up call for us to have mark and steve and those guys there at that time because it it told us that we could stop at any time and take a break gostaria de apresentar dois integrantes do grande mud honey Mr. Steve Turner and Mr. Mark Arm. Right now, right now, Sao Paulo, it's time to kick out the jams, motherfuckers! It was very obvious it was going to be the last one for Warner Brothers. Everybody at Reprise was gone, basically, you know. One of the new guys at Warner's, you know, wanted to hear demos and didn't hear a hit and all that kind of shit, which we'd never had to deal with before. We'd always just, you know, delivered the finished product to them and they did what they could with it, you know. He wanted to drop Mudhoney right when he got there, but he was going to wait to hear the demos. And he was actually impressed with what they had done. I'm like, hey, what whoop do you do for you, right? He knew that we weren't going to make him any more money. And I don't think like Reprise had had a radio hit since Alanis Morissette, which was three or four years before, which in major label time is, is forever. He was brought in because he had produced the Breakthrough Sugar Ray album. They brought him in because they figured since he'd produced a crappy Breakthrough record that he could get more made. <laughs> you know, I remember there was one song, Oblivion, which, you know, that was the song that, you know, that, 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 that the boss thought was the single. He had all these, like, little detail, like, mix ideas that he had to throw in there. He'd had some other hits, so, you know, these record people get cocky and they think they, they, they can, I, I can hear a hit now, I got the golden ear. We probably went into the studio to mix Oblivion five, six, seven, eight, I don't know how many times. It shows exactly why the record industry is dying. 
because <laughs> they just throw money at bullshit for no reason. Each record you do for a record label, the, the advance grows, and we were selling less and less records. I think they got keen to us as well. They knew that we would, you know, take, you know, our money and record cheaply and keep in pocket the rest. So if we didn't spend it recording, we weren't going to get it anyway. Why don't we actually hire a producer and spend some money and see what that's like? Obviously, no one's going to give us that money again. It was a great record on so many different levels, produced by the legendary Jim Dickinson. you know, released into major obscurity. It was one of the first records that they put out at like a higher price. Once the record came out, they just sort of did nothing with it. They wanted it to disappear. You know, there was that time that we had to drop them and, and the conversation was almost like, you know, who cares, you know, <laughs> they, they, they'll go on and do their thing. Nobody was surprised and uh, the uh, relationship ended in a really good way where it was like, you know, I think we all agreed that even if they, if Warner Brothers wanted to keep the Arbor wanted to keep them on, probably wasn't the right place for them to be. The music industry had completely changed. It was fairly brutal. Like, the shows were getting really small. It was definitely the lowest point as far as playing live shows in the States. It was like, fuck, man, like 150 people in some shitty Florida town or something. I was like, ugh. It must have been a pretty discouraging situation for them to be in. And of course, subsequently, Matt Lucan left, which was a factor in and what was going on as well, I believe. It seemed like a pretty good time to quit. You know, the touring wasn't going to make us any money anymore, you know. I think he might have even stuck around as long as he did because he thought he was going to let the rest of us down if he quit. And that was a tough blow. The last three or four years of the band, I was like hoping that somebody else would quit or somebody else would make a move so I didn't have to. Because I hate to be the one quitting. I hate to let people down. And I was just kind of sick of music and pop culture in general altogether. I just hated everything to do with it and anybody who felt it was important. I was working as a carpenter during my off time. It was kind of like going back to the beginning, back when I was like 18, 19 again. I'll work during the week and go play Melvin's gigs on the weekend, you know. It's kind of like having to go back to that. It's like, I didn't want to do that. There's some drinking and smoking to do. We had always kind of, you know, had this idea of Mud Honey being Mark, Steve, Matt, and Dan. And if one of us, you know, was not in the picture, that we would not be a band. You know, I don't know if that's some kind of idealistic kind of, you know, three musketeers and whatever. But uh, I guess there's four. Right? But, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, so when Matt quit, my whole thing was, well, the idea of getting another bass player is not something that I'm into at all. Dan didn't want to do it without Matt. They were kind of like the two partners to me and Mark. They roomed together and all that kind of stuff, you know. These guys wanted to start an internet record label and they hired me to produce an album. Mud Honey came up in the conversation as being a band that just gets better as time goes on. And so we got a hold of them and they said they'd be interested in talking about it. It's probably been about a year and so we got together. Started working on some things and it felt good. There's a chemistry that we have. So I went up there and met the guys and I made them an offer they couldn't refuse. Money talks. <laughs> and that song ended up kind of starting off our next record. That's kind of how we got that ball rolling again.
I am a registered nurse and I work at uh, the main trauma centre, uh, Harbourview Hospital, here in Seattle. The elements of my job are working on specific things in the emergency room, what are called trauma codes, um, where someone has a trauma injury of some sort, gunshot, knife, motor vehicle, fell off a cliff, whatever. People have some you know, preconceived and prejudiced ideas about what being in a band is and, you know, oh, you're a philanderer or a drug addict or a, a person with low responsibility. But it's come out, obviously, it's hard to conceal in this town that you're in Mudhoney because, you know, you've got pictures in the press and stuff like that. So When Mudhoney first started and um, they came to Australia very early and my band went to America around the same time, 88, 89, and we became friends just because we were... In As a teenager, I'd been obsessed with uh, with punk rock you know I'd sort of mucked around with some friends at high school just like in the garage or the back room or whatever and I actually started off wanting to be the singer of the band but um, as it turned out we could not find a bass player and I couldn't play bass and sing at the same time so I became a bass player but I was uh, I had a bass guitar and I was interested in I'd already been playing with guy in in blood loss and I was like you know if Matt doesn't want to do this anymore Guy would be perfect for the band. You know, he's a good friend already, and he's a great bass player. He's got lots of really, really cool ideas. It was a little strange, though, because I've been a fan of the band, and so I always considered the band to be, you know, the four-piece that it originally was with Matt on bass. You know, learning the songs and fitting in wasn't that difficult. I started off just by going over to Steve's place in Seattle and sitting out on his porch and just uh, doing the songs with an acoustic guitar. The first practice we had with Guy, you know, at this point I was just still kind of, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, okay, you know, what a, you know, getting a new bass player. He comes in and starts playing, and I'd been in there, I knew it was, you know, this was going to be cool, and, you know, he's a great bass player. and That was really great to get a fourth person in the room that was, you know, fully engaged again, like Matt had been at the beginning. Uh, definitely Guy brought, uh, um, Guy brought some new energy to the band, you know. <laughs> Spent a couple months teaching him their catalog and finally started to move forward and write new songs. He's got a different style, but he's a very, very good player. Excellent choice to play bass in Mud Honey. I was actually thrilled to pieces when I found out that he was going to join the band. You know, and they're still great friends with Matt, too, so it works out, you know. I mean, Matt comes to the occasional Mud Honey show and sits out back and drinks all their beer, so it still works out, you know. You know, he does the same thing he was doing before, he just doesn't get on stage, basically, you know? <laughs> Bud Honey would never have left Sub Pop if it wasn't for the fact that Sub Pop was going through huge, huge growing pains during the time that Mud Honey was having the most success in their early days. You know, um, and I, I think they, they would never have left, so it, 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 it makes sense. And as a music fan, you know, I mean, you always love seeing that kind of stuff. You know, if a record collector, like you're looking at the back of the record, like, oh man, so in that, in that era, they went back. You know, wow, I want to hear that record, you know? I don't want to hear that major label crap. I want to hear that one, you know? It seemed like I ran into Jonathan at, at some show. I walked by him, I'm like, hey, Jonathan, how you doing? And he's like, so when, when, when are we going to get the next Mud Honey record? And I was kind of like, you know, taken aback. I'm like, you want to put out another Mud Honey record? He's like, of course. And that, I mean, that to me, that was just kind of, well, that's cool. There are few joys greater than the joy of knowing that Mud Honey was going to come back to Sub Pop when the time came. And it was something that we all felt really excited about. And it was something that made us feel super proud was kind of for them just to come home because that's still the way we saw it. It didn't feel even like the good old days, it felt better than that. You know, it really felt like a homecoming. Sub Pop was no longer the like flying by the seat of its pants, making it up as they were going along. We were both learning at the same time, and they were learning how to be a record label, and we were learning how to be a band, you know? They learned from their mistakes, and you know, I can't imagine being on a better label. People who come to work here, you know, the early days are mythical. So, you know, now Mark is in the office all the time and there's a certain earthbound quality, which I think, frankly, suits Mark better. I don't think he necessarily wants to be a rock god. But there was this real feeling, you know, 
the prodigal son, you know, this whole idea of like the band that built Sub Pop is coming back. into the 90s kind of energized us. After we weren't getting paid for any of it, we were playing a lot more music, collectively and individually and stuff. We were like doing a crap load more music than we'd done in years. Mudhoney's style is not mainstream. They never wanted it to be mainstream, and I'm very glad they never made the compromises some of the other bands tried to make. It's the big, fuck you guys. <laughs> In a world where the white stripes and the dirt bombs are getting national attention, like Mud Honey made a lot more sense. And for the reason that Mud Honey became popular again was because they were almost a direct link to, to that time and to that place and to you know to Nirvana. For kids who'd never seen Nirvana, for them this was like a living tangible link to that whole scene. As great as those early records are, they're better now. You know, we recorded that and Under a Billion Suns kind of in similar manners where we would uh, just go for a long weekend with one engineer in a studio and then and put down three or four songs and then mix those and then do the same thing with someone else when we had like three or four more songs written. And to me, both those two records seem kind of of a pair. It's a patriotic duty to make sweet love tonight. Come on, little girl. I'd become a dirty old man with a heart on the wall. I like the record a lot. The songs are more stripped down and simple and easy to understand right off the bat. I never like all of our songs, you know, and I never like all of our recordings, you know. This one came closer. We did it all in one weekend. We'd done most of the tracking like by Friday evening, and then I started doing the vocals and finished most of the vocals, I think, by Saturday evening. Basically, I'm now, it was the first completed take. Oh, I remember coming to the end of the song and I had to like, kind of threw up my hands so Dan knew that this was like the end and that was the take, you know. It was like, wow, that it's not going to get any better than that. You know, they've been able to withstand a lot because they not just stuck together, but they never lost sight of who they were as friends. You know, they always say, don't go into business with your friends. Well, sometimes your friends are all you got. They're all total music nerds. You can go out, sit down to dinner, and inevitably it turns, turns into like, you know, no, that band was not punk rock. They were like post-punk rock. They've always played by their own rules, and they have a very high level of integrity, and they really understand what it takes to rock. Nowadays, the tours are short. 
around work schedules, around kids, around, I mean, whatever, you know, around various different things. So typically it's uh, a block of time is picked and then it's just filled. I mean, that's what it comes down to. It adds a bit of a sort of vacation vibe to things for us because we don't, you know, we don't go out all the time. And when we do go out, it's kind of, you know, once, twice a year, it's kind of special for us. And we go in places we want to go and yeah, we get to hang out. I'm grateful that we get to tour it all. You know, I'm grateful that, that there are people out there who give a shit and who want to see us and who will bring us over to Japan or bring us down to Brazil or do a show with us someplace in Europe, you know. Unfortunately, we can't tour the way we used to be able to tour because everyone works or has commitments with their family. So when we do tour, we tend to pack a lot of stuff into a short period of time, which may not be the smartest way to go about doing things, but it's the only way we can. It's, you know, fun for us. You know, we, it's low key. We're not trying to sell records necessarily. There's no pressure for us to get out there and, you know, work the record. It's a cool space right now. You know? I am glad that we are not in a position where music is our only thing and that like we have to worry about uh, catering to a certain crowd. I think we're really lucky that we get to do whatever the fuck we want despite the crowds. You know, there's a lot of people think of music as a way to get something else. To me, and I think the rest of the band, music is an end in and of itself. You know, it's not like a way to get fame and fortune and pussy and drugs or whatever, you know. Thinking about music like that just kind of creeps me out. And I think, you know, that might have be the result of kind of the music that we came up through, which if you were a kid playing hardcore in like 1981 and 82, the idea that you were gonna make money or have fame or get laid or, well, maybe you might get drugs, you might get laid, but it wasn't like, you know, like, anybody was clamoring to hear this kind of music except for a handful of other kids your own age. There, there wasn't any idea that there was like a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you know? We were doing this just to amuse ourselves, and I still am. this be the official document you know as long as those guys want to make records I'm gonna put them out you know hopefully they're not gonna to want to make too many of them too quickly or else we'll, we'll all end up back in the straits that we were in 20 years ago I just think a lot of it's luck and, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, just sheer talent, just, you know, and blistering licks and, you know, hot, hot, hot grim fills. <laughs> well, really, it, that's what it is. I mean, we're just a fucking great band, really, you know. Yeah. It's a proven fact, isn't it? It got universal praise and universal play. The only person, quite ironically, who gave it a bad review it's Grant Alden. I'm calling you out right here, motherfucker. <laughs> white shoes. <laughs> wearing a big old white shoes. There's a lot of pictures and videos of me wearing big old white shoes, and I'm like, damn, why didn't I have a little more fashion sense back then? <laughs> it was in the hotel lobby where we were staying, and Lucan was walking by, and I said, hey, Matt, say hi, say hi to my girlfriend. And I handed him the phone. He never didn't know, never met my girlfriend, didn't know who she was, and I had just kind of met the band, so it was the first time we toured with them. So I go, hey Matt, here, uh, 
Say hi to my girlfriend. And so he grabbed the phone and says, how big's your pussy? <laughs> the first words out of his mouth.